Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Patriots History. Hold on one second here. Let me do something. There's this. Okay, that's better. Anyway, welcome back to Patriots History. I'm Larry Swikart, co-author of Patriots History of the United States with Michael Allen, now in its 41st printing. Um, <clears throat> reminder, sign up for our newsletter. Scroll way down on the Patriots on the Wild World History page and sign up for the newsletter, you should automatically get an updated PDF of chapter 23, what we call the 20th anniversary of Patriots history, which covers the years 2018 to 2023. If you don't, email me at Larry at wildworldofhistory.com and I'll send it off quick, fast, and in a hurry. Um, <clears throat> I am also working on a new book, will be out next year, called America in the 21st Century. So it's basically the last 25 years. Um, so a reminder, we have full curricula at Wild World of History in U.S. and in world history. U.S. is 22 units. It goes with the latest edition of Patriots History, 22 chapters. I teach every chapter in high production video, maps, slides, stuff behind me going on. Um no license to expire. Yours as long as you need it. It's all digital, all downloaded. The world history course is 15 units with 15 videos. Uh, there are larger units with larger videos, about an hour to hour, 15 minutes each. Same thing, all yours as long as you want them. Uh, no license to expire, all digital. So check those out. There's also amazing programs there under the VIP. If you've got an extra $6 a month, consider subscribing to the VIP because I put up all sorts of ongoing new video series. Current one is Churchill Integrity. I've got over 15 units there, 15 videos. It's about 10, 12 hours worth. Reagan, the American president, got about uh, 20 hours worth there, along with five or six other lesson series that aren't directly from the book, but involve such things as communism and socialism, time and money. You want to see all that stuff. So find an extra six bucks a month and subscribe to the VIP at Wild World of History. And if you want more politics, go over to the Wild World of Politics and uh, join the Insider for $6 a month. Uh, you can get my Larry's Commentary Monday, Wednesday, Friday, about 15 minutes a pop. Deep insight. Get my very best analysis, polling, everything else. All right, let's get started. We are in Chapter uh, 10. Real, ideals and, and realities of reconstruction. And as always, I'm using the 10th anniversary or the 15th anniversary edition of Patriots History of the United States. And I'm on page um, 379. Now, let me check something here. Hold on. Okay, so what I did was I checked the 20th anniversary edition because we have a whole bunch of updates with new research in there just to make sure I wasn't uh, missing any of those updates, and we're not. So we're going to start on page 329, I'm sorry, 379. Four post-war questions. Four issues emerged in the post-bellum struggle over Reconstruction. One, what economic compensation, if any, would be given to the freedmen? Two, what would their political status be? <clears throat> Three, to what extreme... To what extent would the federal laws, I'm having trouble today, aren't I? To what extent would the federal laws governing either economics or politics in the South be enforced and prosecuted? And four, who would determine the pace and priorities of the process, the president or Congress? Disagreement existed as to which of these four issues should take priority. Although Thaddeus Stevens cautioned, quote, if we do not furnish the freedmen with homesteads, we'd better left them in bondage, unquote. Frederick Douglass warned that it was the ballot that was a critical element. Slavery, he said, is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. The first issue, that of economic compensation was thoroughly intertwined with the question of amnesty for Confederates. By the way, let me go back to Frederick Douglass. You know, he had a very interesting comment. He said that um, the ballot box 
the jury box and the cartridge box were what guaranteed liberty, right? You needed to own guns. Anyway, the first, uh, the first issue of economic compensation was thoroughly intertwined with the question of amnesty for Confederates. Any widespread land distribution had to come from the former Confederates, yet to confiscate their property violated the Constitution. If, after they had pledged their allegiance to the United States, they were once again declared citizens. Uh, this is why I think Lincoln made a significant error. Um, can't blame him, but uh, he wanted to unite the country, but he needed to have declared the entire Confederacy traitors to the Constitution. You can always pardon them later. You can always go back and fix it. But by affixing that label, then they would have lost all their claim to private property to and slaves. Just a thought. Um, few, if any, freedmen thought equality meant owning a plantation, but virtually all of them thought it entitled them to the right, as Lincoln said, to eat the bread of their own hand. Some thought land would accompany Union occupation and emancipation. A caravan of free blacks followed Sherman's army through Georgia, and by the time he reached South Carolina, he actually sought to institute a 40 acres and a mule program with his special field order number 15. This set aside South Carolina's sea islands for this set aside South Carolina's sea islands for freedmen, giving each family 40 acres and lending each an army mule. More than 40,000 freedmen settled on Sherman land, but the policy was ad hoc and not approved by Lincoln, who had the prospect of Reconstruction to consider. Breaking up the plantations followed natural rights principles of recompense when someone profited from stolen property. As Virginia Freedman explained, quote, we has a right to the land where we are located. Didn't we clear the land and raise its crops? But a republic did not confiscate property without due process, and the Constitution explicitly prohibited ex post facto laws. That is, you can't pass a law that makes it criminal to do something before the law was passed. For the government to have proceeded to legally confiscate slave owners' property, it would have had to change slave owners, charge slave owners with a crime. But what crime? Slavery had been legal, and indeed Lincoln had been only a step away from a constitutional amendment giving it specific constitutional sanctions. To have retroactively defined slaveholding as a crime for which property confiscation was perhaps just punishment would have opened a legal door to bedlam and ultimately terror. What would prevent any majority in the future from defining an action in the past as a crime for which some appropriate punishment was then needed? Well, we saw this, did we not, with Joe Biden and the January 6 people, basically making up crimes that walking through the Capitol, taking pictures, was obstruction of justice or threatening congressional action or some nonsense like that. Uh, what would prevent any majority in the future from defining an action in the past as a crime for which some appropriate punishment was then needed? And had Southern land been handed over to the freedmen, no doubt future generations of white descendants of the plantations would have concocted their own proposals for reparations. They would have had a point. One option for Lincoln early on, which could have satisfied the 40 acres and a mule that advocates wanted, was to label all Confederates traitors and then grant them conditional amnesty based on partial proportional penalty of land to each slave owned in 1861. In 1865, however, the reality was that even the towering genius of Lincoln did not foresee the legal implications of failing to brand the Southerners traitors. Nor was there any political support except among the vengeful Sumner Stevens cabal for such a policy. Nobody wanted this. Sometimes there was, is no good solution to human problems. This is one thing I think if you can get anything out of Patriot's history, you need to get. That even the most brilliant people can't foresee every problem. And that sometimes, even if they can foresee every problem, there's no good answer. I mean, um, there's a, actually a pretty good discussion of this in The Avengers, the first movie, The Avengers. And there's this discussion, kind of an argument between Iron Man and Captain America. 
And Iron Man always has an out, a, a clever response. Oh, well, then we'll do this. Oh, well, then we'll do that. And Captain America says, sometimes there's no good response. Sometimes you're going to lose soldiers. I mean, think of it as much as we pounded and bombed and shelled Iwo Jima and Okinawa, as much preparation as we took, those islands still were phenomenally costful, costly, I guess, in human lives. There's sometimes when you just, there's no option other than to go straight in at great cost. Uh, this is what really upset me about those so-called law enforcement officers standing around Uvalde. Yeah, it probably is going to cost a life or two to take that shooter, but that's what you signed up for. Those kids did not. You needed to go in there and fix that. Anyway, just my opinion. Without a land policy, many freedmen soon fell into a series of contractual labor relations with the former owners, though often not of their own, known as sharecropping. Under the sharecropping system, in which two-thirds of all Southern sharecroppers were white, so it's important to keep in mind the sharecroppers were mostly white, black and white laborers entered into contracts or agreements with white plantation owners who still possessed the land and had farm implements with white, uh, but they lacked the workers. So this situation, the freedmen who don't have any education have some skills around farms, but they don't have any equipment. So they lack land and equipment, but they have the labor. And the former plantation owners have the land and they have the equipment, but they don't have the labor. So they enter into these contracts called sharecrop sharecropping. <clears throat> Typical contracts gave the landowner 50% of the crop and the laborers 50%, although drafting a typical sh sharecropping contract proved daunting. Each contract was individually negotiated, including length, share, and nature of supervision, and so on. In some cases, share tenants provided their own tools, seed, and everything except the land, whereas in others, some freedmen worked purely as wage laborers. Sharecropping has received rough treatment from historians, but less so from economists for a number of reasons. First, given the strengths and weaknesses of the former slave owners and freedmen, it represented a logical market solution, providing land and capital for laborers who lacked both, and a labor system for the landowners without laborers. Second, the contracts are far more flexible and competitive than once thought. They were not lifetime agreements, but temporary arrangements. My uh, friend and mentor and instructor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, did a book on this called Without, I think it was called Without Contract or Consent. That may be Higgs's book. But Steve DeCani, my advisor, did a book on this. And basically, it showed that the sharecroppers moved around within the South as to who was paying the best. So they weren't tied to the land like feudal serfs, they were free laborers. Third, both parties had to work together to adjust to weather and market changes, and finally, given the lack of education among the freedmen, sharecropping minimized transaction costs, while at the same time extended new levels of freedom and responsibility to ex-slaves. So I think the conclusion has to be that it was a reasonable system. Still, criticism of sharecropping are warranted because it suffered from many deficiencies. Neither landowner nor laborer had an incentive to significantly upgrade the land or implements. The laborers didn't because they didn't own the land, and the landowner didn't because he didn't own the labor. He couldn't control the labor. So they um, rather both had an incentive to farm the land into barrenness or to refrain from engaging in technological or management innovations that would improve productivity. So there's no buy-in, really, by the former slaves to improve the land. Opportunities to gouge the sharecroppers, black and white, also abounded. In some regions, freedmen found movement of sharecroppers, uh, found it difficult to move about to take advantage of better contract terms. Data on the movement of sharecroppers suggests, however, that their movements correlated strongly with higher paying contracts so the implication is that the sharecroppers knew where there were better conditions and higher pay 
and therefore monopoly situations occurred less frequently than some economic historians claim. On average, sharecropping proved an excellent temporary market mechanism. Many freedmen did not stay in that situation, but moved on. Blacks acquired property and wealth more rapidly than whites, a somewhat misleading statistic, because you've got to remember, the blacks began with nothing, so obviously any increase is going to be a huge percentage increase versus whites who started with something but moved up. And across the South, they owned perhaps 9% of all land by 1880. Now think of this. That's an, an incredible statistic I used to point out to my students. By 1880, the freedmen, former black slaves, owned 9% of all the land in the South. That doesn't sound like much, but folks, 9% from no land ownership whatsoever in a period of 15 years was remarkably fast. That's, that's an amazing development. In certain pockets, however, they achieved ownership much more slowly. In Georgia, blacks only owned 2% of the acreage in the state by 1880. In others, more rapidly. Robert Kinzer's study of North Carolina showed that in five counties, black ownership of town lots rose from 11% in 1875 to almost 19% by 1890, despite legal codes and racism. Black income levels also grew more rapidly than white levels, again, in part because they were beginning with virtually no income as it was technically defined. It bears repeating racism and discrimination certainly existed and unquestionably took an economic and human toll on the freedmen. Nobody is saying it didn't. But to ignore the hard-won genuine gains or to minimize them as mere exceptions trivializes their contributions, contributions and achievements. Moreover, it does a disservice to the freedmen to automatically view them as laborers instead of potential entrepreneurs. Historians have tended to bury stories of black entrepreneurship after the Civil War. Yet for for many former slaves contributed important inventions and founded useful, profitable companies in the postbellum period. Alabamian Nate Shaw, an illiterate tenant farmer, moved from farm to farm, expanding his share of the crop and renting out mules to haul lumber or to do other odd jobs. Despite competition from an influx of poor whites, struggles with unscrupulous landlords who tried to defraud him of his crops, and merchants' reluctance to extend him credit, Shaw persevered until he became self-sufficient and headed the sharecroppers' union where as an older man, he led protests against hand seizures by sheriff's deputies in the 1930s. Fellow Am Alabamian Andrew Jackson Beard, born a slave in Jefferson County, found it too expensive to haul apples from his farm to Montgomery, whereupon he quit farming and constructed a flour mill in Hardwick, Alabama. Experimenting with a plow design, he patented the plow in 1881, sold the patent three years later for $4,000, a very large sum at that time, and returned to inventing. By the 1890s, he had accumulated $30,000 and entered a real estate market, although he continued to invent, creating a rotary steam engine in 1892. He had previously worked on railroads and knew of the dangers of joining railroad cars together a process done almost entirely by hand in which the worker would place a large metal pin in a coupling as the device is exactly aligned. So these two railroad car parts would come like this. And when, when you got the hole just like that, he would slip the pin through there. As a solution, uh, misjudgment costs railroaders their hands and fingers and Bert and, Bert Beard himself lost a leg crushed in a coupler accident. As a solution, in 1897, Beard came up with the famous Jenny coupler, the reverse metal hands that fold backward on contact, then latch like hands shaking. If you ever played with Lionel or HO gauge trains, they look like this. They're upside down hands, and these parts bend and then lock. So it goes like this. They bend and they lock, right? That's the way you hook together the train. Save Incredible numbers of injuries. Variants of the 
Jenny remain in use in railroads today and over the years, Beard's invention has saved untold thousands of railroad employees from severe personal injury. Credit records for the Virginia uh, R.G. Dunn & Company, for example, reveal that of the thousand enterprises about which the company kept information between 1865 and 1879, more than 220 were Black-owned and operated. That's one quarter. Although Black businesses were usually located in areas of town with higher Black populations, the advertising indicates that African-American entrepreneurs appealed to white customers, too. Almost 80% of the firms were single owner operations, and these entrepreneurs quickly gained experience in the workplace. After 1869, the ratio of new to failed firms dropped, and even some of those that had closed did so because the proprietor had died. In other words, they weren't failing a lot. <clears throat> in fact, <clears throat> the Virginia records showed virtually no difference in failure rates between black merchants and white merchants from 1870 to 75 despite the presence of racism and prejudice. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> Attitudes of freedmen toward former masters span the spectrum. Some former slaves actually expressed anger at Union troops for killing and maiming the, quote, young masses. One South Carolina slave, seeing one of the master's four sons return home from battle, quote, he jaw split and he tooth all shine through the cheek, was, quote, so mad I could have killed the Yankees. Other slaves secretly celebrated when tragic news came to the plantation's mistress. Quote, it made us glad to see Dim cry, said one slave. They made us cry so much, unquote. News that a local leader of slave patrols had been killed touched off joyous shouting in slave quarters. On occasion, wartime hardships turned once hesitant masters and mistresses into monsters. One mistress, hearing of her son's death, whipped the slaves until whipped the slaves until she collapsed of exhaustion. A Virginia slave observed the treatment of blacks grew harsher as the Yankee armies drew closer. Facing blacks now as tenants and sharecroppers more than as free whites viewed their former chattel with suspicion. Quote, the tenants act pretty well, uh, pretty well towards us, wrote a Virginia woman, but that doesn't prevent their being pretty certain of their intention to stampede when they get a good chance, they are nothing but an ungrateful, discontented lot, and I don't care how soon I get rid of mine, unquote. Another owner in Texas, quote, a pretty good boss, as slave owners went, made a huge mistake when informing his slaves of their emancipation. Quote, you can just work on if you want to, and I'll treat you just like I always did. All but one family, like birds, just flew. <laughs> wonder why you would think otherwise. The Freedmen's Bureau attempted to serve as a clearinghouse for economic and family information, but its technology was too primitive and the task too Herculean. Somewhat more successful were the efforts by Northern teachers, missionaries, and administrators to assist slaves in military and contraband camps by writing letters for freedmen trying to reach relatives. After Black newspapers were established in the 1870s, Advertisement frequently sought information on family members separated during slavery. The influence of Black educators like Booker T. Washington was still more than a decade away. Washington, the son of a slave, had just started his teaching career in 1875 as Reconstruction wound down. Founding the Tuskegee Institute, Washington hired faculty, established productive relationships, with local whites, raised money, recruited students, and set about teaching printing, carpentry, botany, cabinet making, farming, cooking, and other skills that would assist freedmen and their children in gaining employment quickly. He obtained benefactions from Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, and George Eastman, and suffered insults in order to advance his views of Black success. Without ignoring racial discrimination and hatred, Washington nevertheless focused on encouraging African Americans to acquire property, to get education, to live with impeccable character. In time, he believed relations would improve. At the Atlanta Cotton States and International Exposition in September 1895, Washington delivered a speech later noted for its ambiguity and elasticity. He seemed to accept the separate but equal Jim Crow doctrine of the day, 
yet he reminded whites that blacks were not going away and that ultimately they had to work together. All right, that's a good place to stop. We'll start next time with Friedman and the politics in the South. Remember, if you need a curriculum, check out our curriculum at the Wild World of History. Uh, I suggest to people, if you've got an eighth grader, you're not going to teach it this year, get the curriculum now and you, teacher, start watching the videos. It's going to take you a while. There's 22 videos of 45 minutes to an hour each. So with those videos, you'll be ready to plan your class the following year without a whole lot of trouble. So start early. Uh, take advantage of our sale price, which I think is in effect until August 1st. Still $199 as opposed to almost uh, $300. So check it out. And I will see you guys back here on Monday.